The first section from Unit 2 is on classifying substances. Chemistry is a study of matter. Uh, so what is matter exactly? Uh, it's anything that takes up space and has a mass. So it's got to have a volume and a mass. Uh, and so what we are going to be looking at majority of this year are pure substances. Something that has uniform and unchanging composition. So pure elements or pure compounds. Um, we'll, we will get into some solutions later on. We'll talk about uh, we'll talk about alloys as well, but for the most part, we're going to refer to pure substances, uniform and unchanging composition throughout the entire substance. We're going to start with the three states of matter that everyone's most familiar with, solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, and beyond just talking about what they are, maybe getting into what it looks like on an atomic level, if we were to zoom in. We haven't talked about atoms yet, uh, but if we were looking at the particles, what's actually going on, okay? Uh, so what is a solid? Well, if I asked you to, to give me an example of one, I'm sure you could do that. But if you try to actually define it, it becomes a, a little bit tricky. Um, so a definition of it would say a form of matter that has its own shape and volume. Okay, so it doesn't rely on a container, all right? So what we usually are thinking about when we're talking about solids, liquids, and gases and how we're going to define them is we want to think about what happens when we put it inside of a container, okay? If we put something in a container, does it take the volume of the container? Does it fill the container? Does it retain its own shape? Okay, so this example down here, if you put this rock inside of this cardboard box, the rock doesn't suddenly expand to fill the shape of the box, okay? So it's, it's got its own shape and matter. It's got a definite volume and a definite shape. Uh, if we were to look at the particles on the inside of it, we would see that they are tightly packed together. They're not moving, okay? And they're going to form some sort of nice repeating pattern, which we'll talk about later on. But they form a nice repeating pattern, uh, and they get locked into position. They're not really going to move around very much at all. They might vibrate back and forth, which we talked about um, in a previous section, but they're not going to move a whole lot. They're, they're pretty well locked into position. If you start heating up a solid, it will begin to expand, but only a tiny bit, so these particles will fill a little bit more space. Remember, when you're heating something, what you're doing is you're giving it more kinetic energy, okay? Kinetic energy, Ke, uh, which means it's moving faster. So if you start heating this stuff up, these particles move a little bit and expand, okay? We said the shape is definite, and it does not fill the volume of its container. So again, when we're thinking about how we define solids and liquids and gases, think about what happens when we put these things in the container. Okay, the solid retains its own shape and volume. Okay, so liquids, if we put it in a container, it's a form of matter that flows, has constant volume, and takes the shape of its container. Okay, so again, always think about what happens when we put it inside of a container, whatever substance in a container. Uh, so it, it flows, meaning the particles are able to tumble over each other. They're no longer locked into position, okay? So like water, liquid water, for instance, those particles are able to tumble over each other. They're not locked into a position, okay? They'd be locked if they were in the form of ice, right, a solid, okay? A liquid has constant volume, meaning the volume's not going to go up or down, all right? It fills the container as much as there is of it. It doesn't fill the entire container, which we'll see is a little bit different, unless you have enough of it, like down here, all of these Powerade bottles, okay? They're filled up to the top with a liquid, all right? Uh, but if there was only this much liquid in here, let's say we drank half of this and it was down to right there, okay, it wouldn't suddenly magically go fill in the top part of this, all right? Whereas gases would. So if you try to, if you removed half the gas, well, suddenly the gas would fill the entire container. Liquids have a constant volume, but they do take the shape of their container unlike a solid. Particles are not rigidly held in place. Like we were saying just a second ago, the particles are able to tumble over each other. They are in contact with each other though still. This is less packed than a solid, okay? Since you're breaking apart that rigid structure, these particles have some space in between them, okay? So it's, it's less packed than a solid, which means it's usually less dense than a solid. Okay, uh, the only example that, that you can really think of that's opposite of that uh, is ice and water. Uh, it's kind of a weird example. It, it's like the most common, you know, liquid and solid that we probably deal with, or at least liquid here. Um, but when we are talking about it in terms of density, ice is actually less dense than water. So it's one of the, it's the, one of the only known things out there where uh, the solid is actually uh, less packed than the liquid. So it's kind of a, a rule breaker. So don't get hung up on that because that's that's pretty rare that this happens. Usually it's the other way around because as we heat stuff up, stuff moves around, which allows for more space, which means less density. 
okay? Things become more liquid. Uh, this particle is able to move past each other. It takes the shape of its container, but might not fill it. It only fills it if there's enough of the liquid to fill it. Liquids will expand ever so slightly when heated as well. Uh, they'll, they'll take up a little bit more space, but not a whole bunch, not a large noticeable amount. Okay, gases. So this is the form of matter that not only flows to conform to the shape of its container, but also fills the entire volume of its container. Okay, so we got some balloons down here, uh, for example. All right. Uh, if you were to suddenly take half of the gas out of this, uh, this flower balloon here, uh, it wouldn't be like, well, the gas just stays in the bottom. The gas would still try to fill up the whole thing. That wouldn't have as much force against the walls of the balloon, so it wouldn't inflate as much, but it would still be evenly dispersed throughout that entire balloon. Okay, so it fills the entire volume of its container. It's able to flow as well. Uh, so again, we're heating stuff up, right? We're increasing kinetic energy. Uh, solids were tightly packed together, locked into place. Liquids were still touching each other, but they were able to tumble over each other. Gases, we've actually broken the physical contact between particles, and now they're just flying around inside of their container, okay? Uh, particles of gases are far apart, so that's kind of the one downside of this picture down here is actually there's a lot more space in between particles than what's really shown, but you kind of get the idea. Uh, and because of that, since there's so much space in here, gases can be compressed. Imagine taking this cube of space and then shrinking it down, right, taking all three sides of it and making it smaller. Uh, well, you, you could do that, and you can easily compress this gas, okay? So gases can be compressed or expanded really easily. They fill the entire container, okay? They, they conform to the shape of its container. So always think about what, what happens when you put something in a container when we're trying to define these states of matter. Now, there are other states of matter uh, out there. Um, we've got, you know, superfluids. You've got plasma. There's all kinds of stuff. There's some real weird ones. Um, we're not going to get into that. You only need to be aware of what solids, liquids, and gases look like, you know, kind of on a particle level, and then how we define them, okay, in terms of what they do in a container. The second part of this section is going to deal with the difference between physical and chemical properties, okay? Uh, so, physical properties. Characteristic of matter that can be observed or measured without changing the sample's composition, and it's unique to each substance. Okay, so we're not changing what it's made out of. It's still the same thing. We can only use this to describe pure substances, because otherwise we could be changing what exactly it's made out of, its consistency. So it's got to be a pure substance. Uh, we can't change what it's made out of. And So what sort of stuff are we talking about is a physical property, uh, density of a substance, the color of it, odor, hardness, melting point, boiling point, things like that. Uh, so here's some, you know, some examples down below of physical properties of some common substances. Right? Oxygen gas is colorless. It's a gas at 25 degrees Celsius. Melting point is 219 degrees Celsius. Boiling point is negative 118, or sorry, no, no, negative 183 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then you can see its density at 25 degrees Celsius as well. So all this stuff here is unique to this substance, whatever that substance is, okay? We can't change what it's made out of, uh, and it's describing something that is, is consistent no matter how much we have of it as well. Okay, so under the umbrella of physical properties, there's another term, another two terms that we can use to describe substances, extensive properties and intensive properties, okay? So this is, falls under the umbrella of physical properties. Uh, extensive properties are ones that are dependent on the amount of substance present. So it changes if I change the amount of it. So for instance, something like the mass of it. If I add more, it's going to weigh more. The length of it. If I add more, it's going to be longer. Uh, if I add more, so volume. If I add more of it volume-wise, it's going to take up more space. Okay, so that's just extensive. It changes based on how much you have of it. Intensive, okay, is going to be the opposite. It's independent of the amount of substance present, meaning it doesn't matter how much you have of it, it's always going to be consistent. So density is a great example of that. Whether you have 2 grams of aluminum or 2,000 grams of aluminum, it doesn't matter. If you go to calculate the density, it will always be the same. Uh, color will always be the same. Right? As long as it's a pure substance, it doesn't matter how much you have of it, Okay, it's going to remain the same. For another one here, boiling point and melting point. Uh, this one usually gets kids because they, they forget about this. But if, you know, if I have a single drop of water, okay, and I'm and I want to heat it up to boil it, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. If I have an entire pot of water and I need to boil, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. It sometimes takes longer to heat up 
that pot of water is because there's so much water to try to heat up all at once compared to that single drop, but the boiling point's still the same, right? Doesn't matter how much water I had, the boiling point was always 100 degrees Celsius, okay? Uh, it's very easy to identify substances by looking at intensive properties, okay? And if we get a chance, there's a lab that corresponds to this, okay? All right, and then the opposite of physical properties, chemical properties, the ability or inability of a substance to combine with or change into one or more other substances, okay? Uh, this is always a good good one here as an example, right? We all know what the Statue of Liberty looks like in New York. Uh, that was given to us by the French. However, when the French sent it over to us, they sent us a copper statue. It looked more like this. Basically, you had a giant penny, okay, there in the harbor of New York City, uh, it would have looked more like this when we first got it. Uh, it would have been a very, very heavy thing to send over by ship. Uh, it, I don't imagine it happened all in one piece. But they sent us this statue that would have looked actually like this. What happens with copper, though, is that over time, if you expose it to the environment, it reacts with oxygen, right? And it oxidizes, okay? So you get this copper reacting with oxygen gas. And then you get this compound, copper 2 oxide, which is this green color that you see over here. Uh, if any of you have, like, if you live in an old house and you have copper doorknobs, if you have brass doorknobs, actually, as well, uh, you might see them slowly starting to turn green, and that's from that oxidation happening. Uh, it turns out that this process is sped up in the presence of water and salt water, so if, you know, this thing's sitting there, you know, in the harbor in New York City, it's getting hit with mist and rain and, and water and salt water, uh, so this thing oxidized pretty quickly into the greenish color, this patina that you guys see today. But this is a chemical property of copper, and a lot of metals have this property. They'll oxidize, okay, if they're in the presence of oxygen. Only the noble metals really won't do that, okay? But that's what it looks like. You know, the other stuff does this too. Iron will rust. It turns into that kind of brown-red color you're probably familiar with, okay? That's a chemical property of a lot of metals, all right, so it's the ability or inability of a substance to combine or change into one or more other substances. And then just the last quick thing for, uh, for your notes. When observing properties, it's, you should note the temperature and pressure that you're observing it at. Because if you consider, well, if I'm observing water at 25 degrees Celsius, okay, it's a liquid. It's got a density of one gram per milliliter. It doesn't do a whole lot. It's generally non-reactive. But if you look at water at 100 degrees Celsius, now it's a gas. Its density is significantly lower, right? Okay, and it's a lot more reactive. Uh, and then water at zero degrees Celsius. Now it's a solid. It's got a density of 0.92 grams per liter. So it's, it's different based on the temperature, even though the substance was the same all three times. So whenever you are making observations, you should know what temperature that's occurring at.